Good morning. This is Sue Dibble from the Oakmont Sunday Symposium, and I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Kate O'Hare Palmer, who's a nurse who served in Vietnam 50 years ago. I know she doesn't look it, but it was 50 <laughs> years ago. She's chair of the Women's Veterans Committee of the Vietnam Veterans of America and has become a leader in fighting for the rights of women who served in the military and are serving in the military. Um, without further ado, I'd love you to enjoy her talk. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Sue, for inviting me to this symposium. I honestly didn't know anything about it, but now I do. Um, and it's, it's a different year for all of us with COVID. And I would normally be going back to Washington, D.C. to celebrate Veterans Day back there in November, um, on November 11th, which I always do, since I've become the chair for the Vietnam Women Veterans um, Group for their committee. But I'm really happy to be here with you. And so what I'm gonna share today is uh, a PowerPoint that I put together and I modified it. We've been doing this for years with uh, the junior colleges and the high schools in the area, but I kind of upped the game for um, you people, because I think there's gonna be a lot of veterans in this audience, and this may bring back some memories for some of the veterans in this group. And maybe when we do the talk uh, next Sunday, you guys can ask me a lot of questions about it. I'm going to keep it, this part of my talk, I'm going to keep just basically to what my tour was like, what it was like going into the military um, back in 1967 as a woman going into the Army Nurse Corps and what my tour was like. And I think maybe the discussion for Sunday on some of the topics related to uh, women veterans and their issues today uh, and what we've had to do to keep up our legislation all these years to give us benefits that we did not have. So let's start with the PowerPoint and see where we go, okay? So that's our first thing here. We're not going anywhere. Let's see what happens. There we go. I'll do it in the middle. So I wanted to just mention the um, different women's military services and organizations. There's actually over 40,000 veterans organizations in America. I just wanted to list the top ones for women. Uh, if there's women in the group that have not joined any of these, I would recommend that you do. I didn't put Vietnam Vets of America on because that's so, so close to my home. <laughs> but Vietnam Vets of America welcomes all women that served during the Vietnam era and uh, didn't have to serve in country. So WIMSA, Women in Military Service of America, that is um, outside of Arlington. That was built in 1997 and General, General Wilma Bott was the uh, spearhead for that. It took 10 years to build, more than 10 years. And uh, it's, it's a great place to go and visit. You can go online. I put the website on there and you can put your whole story together if you're a woman vet and uh, with pictures and you can submit it and they have a, um, a database that people can go in when they go to WIMSA and look at all those uh, different people they wanna look up, their relatives or whatever. Then the Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation, uh, that was started way back when in the 80s and Diane Carlson Evans, who was a nurse in Vietnam, she was the spearhead for that. This organization has uh, actually stepped down as an organization with a, with a um, storefront. We have the Eastern Foundation runs uh, some of our uh, events that are at the wall, but we still have a website and you can go on that and there is a store there that you can buy memorabilia from. Probably the most important thing about Vietnam Women's Memorial uh, website, it's, it's an unbelievable wealth of information about women in the military from all wars. 
and a great library of resources of videos and books and papers that have been written about women in the military. Then the next one is Military Women Across the Nation, WAN, which is a group that actually started out as the WAVES, the Navy, but they broadened the group to uh, add all women, all different services. And then the last one is SWAN, which is a relatively new group. And it was started in 2007, uh, Service Women's Action Network. It was actually started by, gee, a woman named Anna Baguati, and she was a Marine. She had started to go to Yale, then she went in the Marine Corps, and she has been an activist ever since. So she started uh, the SWAN group, and it was really about uh, for women and military sexual harassment, sexual trauma. We did a lot of work with her in the beginning and uh, the Vietnam Vets of America stood up with Senator Gillibrand and helped get uh, some of the first legislation through in like 13, 2013, 2014 for uh, military sexual trauma and harassment. So, and Anna has gone on and she's written a book now so she's gone on to some other things. And there's a, another gal that runs that group now. So that's what uh, women in military service, that's what WIMSA looks like. This is what the uh, Vietnam Women's Memorial looks like, like on, that's probably on Memorial Day. Everybody comes and leaves items at that. And it's a very moving, the first time we saw it the first time it was dedicated. I think there wasn't a dry eye in the group. It was very moving for us. And each one of those women has a name. And um, Glenna Goodacre, who was the sculptor that did this from New Mexico, she has passed on now, but she uh, really worked hard putting the faces on these uh, women. And then there's a man soldier on the back that's wounded. But this is a women's memorial. It's not just for nurses. It's for all women that served in Vietnam. And that's um, Diane Carlson Evans and I, that was on 2018. I spoke at the wall. And she is just a pistol. She's something else. She's a force to be reckoned with. Um, I kept this in there because I thought, how did I get into the army? <laughs> Just briefly, I grew up in a family with uh, two brothers and my mom and dad, and my mom and dad met during World War II. They were in the army. And uh, so it was kind of like, that's what you get to is uh, you're kind of predisposed to maybe want to go in the military. But this is my graduation picture from LA County General Hospital. And if you read through that, I thought that I was gonna work with kids at uh, Harbor General, but then my brother went to Vietnam and Tom was there two years before I was there and he served and he got sick with malaria and was in a hospital and sent pictures of the hospital unit back to me and to all the girls that were on the seventh floor at our dorm and uh, we decided there was a group of four of us decided that we would join the army when we graduated because we had a skill set. That took us after we graduated from uh, nurses training, worked for a little while, then went down to Fort Sam Houston, uh, Texas, which it was the medical officers training. And now it's considered the training for all combat medics. They've brought them all there from all over the country. And in fact, the different branches of the services train together there now. It was just the Army at that point. The Army Nurse Corps that was in Vietnam, it's like we look at it and it started, the first three nurses went to Saigon in 1956. It's hard to believe when you look, I'm not gonna talk much about the history of how we got into this war. That's a whole other subject an amazing domino theory subject, but um, the three nurses started in 1956 and they were there to train the South Vietnamese nurses so that they could take care of their soldiers. Then the, the uh, war effort kind of grew. We were no longer just advisors in country. We started sending troops in there, United States did. 
And the first hospital eighth field opened in Natrang in 1962. And by 1968, you can see there's a buildup of um, all these different medical units and 11, there were 11 reserve and um, uh, besides the regular army, there were 11 reserve units there. So the, um, the hospital grew, the hospitals grew from 1965 to 68, really disproportionately, it just grew so fast. I'm looking at here where I go, but the basic reason why most of the women that went to Vietnam, they all say pretty much the same thing. My reason for going is that there are American troops that needed help. They needed things that I could give them in my nursing for profession. <clears throat> the average age of a nurse in Vietnam, in the army nurse corps, not the Navy, but in the army was 23 and a half years old. And they had less than two years experience. Almost 80% were female, 20% male. And there were some married couples in this group. How did we all get to Vietnam after we finished basic training? We took a plane. <laughs> And that song, Leaving on a Jet Plane, that was in the 60s, that was a big song for a lot of us, I'll tell you. I flew over on an on a airlines called Continental. Does anybody remember that one? But Pan Am was big too. <laughs> Let's see, I'm going too fast here. It's going, oh, let's back up. Let's back it up. Well, oh, it's going forward. Let's see here. It keeps going forward. Let me see if I can go back this way. There we go. There we go. So let's try it this way. Uh, so then after we got on our plane ride and we were going into Vietnam and this is what it looked like for the reserve unit that was at the hospital that came after I was in Vietnam. But that was a typical way for a lot of the units to come over to Vietnam. We went on the Continental Airlines and there was just one gal and myself, um, Mary Ann, that went over together. Um, this is what it looked like when we would, after we got to Vietnam, we were in our uh, army greens, that's what it looked like, but then we were given fatigues and we were given assignments that would go, we would be sent all over Vietnam and everybody had different assignments. The thing that's different about when you were in Vietnam as a, as a military person is, it was very rare for a unit to go together. This unit, these guys were all from the 312th of VAC. I was with Second Surge and the 312th of VAC came in and started at our hospital in about September. So they came over together. Most people went to Vietnam by themselves. And I think it was because of the Vietnam vets that we worked so hard so that that would never happen again. Because the isolation of going into a unit by yourself, traveling alone, not really knowing anybody because you hadn't worked with these people before was a real disadvantage. And uh, after, after Vietnam, they learned that they would put units in and they would train them together. They would go overseas together and come back together just like they had done in World War II. This is what it looked like uh, because I went to a place called Chu Lai. Some of the people that are listening will know where that is. It's an I Corps. And uh, AmeriCal Division, which was a big army unit, was stationed right next to the hospital. So, this is a picture of Vietnam that's divided into the uh, core, they call them core groups. And I was in I Corps, which was closer to the DMZ. When I first got there in uh, June of 68, we were taking care of about half Marines and half Army. And then what happened was AmeriCal Division came in and they took over. The Marines went further north to the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone, which was the green line that you see up there on the map. 
and that separated North Vietnam from South Vietnam. And so that's where a lot of the heavy fighting was in the beginning. If you look at the uh, left-hand side of um, South Vietnam, before Laos and Cambodia, you see the line that goes all the way down. That, that was the division of um, the countries but we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia or Laos, although our troops did go in there and we had many hospitals that were right on the borders there to help take care of them. Because the DMZ, um, from the DMZ all the way down south, there was something called the Ho Chi Minh Trail where they, the North Vietnamese would bring a lot of supplies down through that area. And so there'd be a lot of fighting along that, that line. This is a C-140. This is what we took uh, when we traveled uh, longer distances, say from southern, from like Benoit up to Da Nang. But we also started uh, transporting patients in C-140s towards the end of my tour. They had changed them out into total hospital um, planes so that they could transport a lot of patients at a time over to Japan. This is, this is one of our funny signs that we had in Chu Lai at the Second Surge Hospital. Um, everybody came from all parts of the world. And so I somehow got my family to send me that California sign. <laughs> this is what it looked like by like the end of 1969, as far as the base of Chu Lai. And our hospital is right on the edge. You see that point coming out there. Uh, and there's an amphitheater that you see in the background, that fan thing, and that's where the Bob Hope show was in 1968. They had a huge air base, a Marine Air Wing there, uh, where the Phantoms and the A6s would fly north on their sorties. They ended up removing uh, that air base from this area because we were getting bombed too much. This is the area, if you see, that's where Red Cross um, they're all metal, those roofs, and um, that front closest to the screen, you see the, uh, um, the front area close down to the bottom of the screen, that was the emergency room entrance, and then further, a little further out would, uh, was the helicopter pad. You see the ambulance sitting there too. Most of our patients came to us by um, helicopter. I worked at this hospital, I worked both emergency room and operating room. I was trained as an operating room nurse uh, at Letterman before I came overseas. My, my program was supposed to be about eight months, but because the war was uh, tuning up, they, they dropped it to four months, gave us four months training, a couple weeks off, and we were sent to Vietnam. And I got over there, I was sent just two days after Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June. So that was, that was my start. This is another view of the hospital. You look at the, the wooden buildings in the background, those were the quarters for the, the officers, which nurses and uh, the doctors were officers. So they had um, individual rooms in, the, in those um, wooden buildings there. This, these were our patches. So those are, we really, everybody that's been in the military knows they have their own patch. So I had two because I worked at Second Surge Hospital first. Then when the 312th evac came in, I worked with them. Then I went back to the Second Surge when we rotated down to Lai K. And I'll show you pictures of that in a bit. This is one of our, um, uh, officers that was taken off to go. I don't know where he was heading that time, but this was the main main modus of uh, transportation. You you would jump a helicopter as you could to get around the country. This is the um, emergency room. That's another view of it on the ground that I showed you before, and. You see those barrels, those orange barrels that are around the building, those are filled with sand. That was before we had um, put more of a um, um, perimeter for ourselves so that when we had a lot of uh, rocket attacks, 
we we would get rocket frags that would come in through those buildings. It wasn't it wasn't totally safe. So we wore um, flak jackets at night. We wore helmets when we were in in uh, working our shifts. If we were under a red alert or knew that there was going to be attack imminent. This is a picture of one of my friends and her husband. There were nurses that were married. She, these two got married before they came to Vietnam. There were some actual weddings that happened in Vietnam. Um, in those days, this is in the late 60s, you could be married, but if you uh, were pregnant, you had to come back home. You did not get to stay in country. That changed in 1973. Uh, where you could uh, continue in the military if, if you were pregnant. So that, there were major changes that were happening later on, but not in the days when we were there. This is the emergency room with the litters. Uh, this is what we would bring the patients in on and start working on them. That's another picture of it. And those are corpsmen. If there's everybody there. You know, everybody had their job. You had corpsmen, you had um, anesthesia, you had the doctors, the nurses, and different people would take, if we had an overrun, like of every one of those, of course, those pictures, you only took pictures if you weren't really doing much, right? Um, but if the whole emergency area was filled, each person would have probably two or three people working on them. And the nurse may be the one that's making all the decisions on how to triage that person because there are definitely not enough doctors to do triage. The triage meant in, an, in a war zone that you triaged very differently than you do like when I worked in emergency room at Kaiser back here in the United States. Triage is, is that you save the most you can. So the people that were hurt the worst and maybe didn't have as good a chance of survival, they were put off to the side of the room with extra morphine. And you tried to save the most people that you could uh, and let the others go to the side and hopefully get to them. But many of those passed because we couldn't reach them in time. We did take care of a lot of Vietnamese. People don't realize that. We work with Vietnamese uh, and their kids. If you got a Vietnamese person in, you got the whole family and you would treat them and then they would stay the whole time that they were in the hospital with you. And sometimes we would have to medevac them up to um, Da Nang to the South Vietnamese civilian hospitals after we got them stabilized. This is sunrise, not sunset like we have here. This is a sunrise over the ocean. And because I grew up in Seal Beach, Southern California, that was a very soothing thing for me to be able to still see the ocean uh, and see the water because this was a very different time. I was 21, just turned 22 when I went over to Vietnam. It was a major life shift uh, from what I thought it was gonna be, and it was a hundred times more complicated. That's what I can say. This is what, this is like at our BOQ, they call it. This is one of my friends, Mary. Still see her, she lives in Hawaii today with her husband. Um, this was, <laughs> this is a bunker. And the rats in those bunkers were as big as, as the cats that you see walking down the street today. So. A lot of times you really didn't want to go in a bunker, but when we got rocketed, that's where you would go. This is what the um, hallways look like, uh, taking the, the war grew so fast. This grew from a hundred bed hospital to a 400 bed hospital within about seven months. And thank goodness for the engineers. They poured all that concrete. They made all these buildings and added all the Quonset huts because we had so many patients um, to take care of. And then we ended up having a Vietnamese unit where we would have the South Vietnamese. We had North Vietnamese um, people that came into our emergency rooms. I had to take care of some. One of the nights we had some of our own men come in and they were uh, had their legs macheted off below the knee. And 15 minutes later, we had two North Vietnamese that they brought in that actually had done that. 
um, they kept them alive because they wanted to interrogate them. So uh, that was that was a tough unit, tough thing for me to do. I think that's my dog barking in the background. This is what the ward looked like. Um, and this is where the uh, uh, different patients, there's, I didn't take many pictures in the operating room. I have a few because I didn't want to have the, um, I just felt very strongly that I did not want to have people seen like that if they hadn't asked their permission. I'm a very much a soul person and I didn't want that to be something that would carry for the rest of my life anyway. Uh, this is in the operating room here in Chulai. We had, we had four operating rooms and this is post amputation. These are the guys wrapping up the leg afterwards. Um, we did a lot of amputations. This hospital did multiple surgeries. Uh, we had multiple surgeons available. And so we did a lot of specialty surgeries, uh, eye and um, neurosurgery, uh, thoracic surgery, a lot of surgeries went this because this was an evacuation hospital. When I go went back down to second surgical hospital in Lycae, that only did general surgery and orthopedic surgery. And we sent all other kinds of injuries to an evacuation hospital where they could be taken care of. I put this picture in because it's the chapel. And anybody that's been in a war um, has their faith really shaken. Mine was, after three weeks, I bet I threw my Bible out because I just couldn't believe that God would allow people to do this to each other. It was a tough time. And uh, so religion during a war is something that every person that's been in war has to deal with and has to um, come to grips with at some point in their life. And I hope that everyone does. This is um, the fields looking down in Vietnam, some walking along one of our rice paddy areas uh, east of us. This is the helicopters that were the mainstay workhorse of our um, time and they brought our patients, they brought our mail, they brought all kinds of stuff to us and they took us to different places too. And this was a ride where I was taken out when I was transferred because I, after six months, I, in the beginning of January, because we had the 312th unit came in, took over for us, we were transferred and our unit went back to being a second surgical hospital, which was more of a mobile army surgical transport. So <clears throat> I ended up back down in a place called Lycae, which is in three core. And this, uh, this was our sign. Every unit has their own motto. And if you look in the background, those Quonset huts are um, inflatable. This was a must unit, one of four that was in Vietnam in the, uh, 1969. The first one came in in 1967, I think. So they were powered by um, JP4, they were uh, jet fuel, and they were all inflatable, self-contained hospital, 60 beds. And again, like I said, we took care of just um, surgical and orthopedic patients, very small compared to where I was before. There were eight women, there were eight of us at that at this unit area, and this is what it looked like. So you saw that other aerial picture that I showed you of what Chulai looked like. So that was like a city. And then we came to Lai K. And that's it. You see the two cutout areas. This is a rubber plantation. Um, this was owned by Michelin. They charged the army $75 for every tree that we cut down to make the area for us to uh, work in. And uh, we had two areas, one for the enlisted, one for the officers, you can tell left, right. And then the hospital areas in the front. And if you look to the left of the hospital area, those revetments, those double lines, those horizontal lines, those are called revetments. And that was where the, um, Helicopters would fly in with the wounded uh, and then take them to the hospital. There's another picture of our tents. 
I lived in a tent for eight months. I extended, so I stayed longer there. So we had a tent. Uh, there were four of us, there were eight women. So there were four of us to each tent. No running water, no electricity in the beginning. Um, we ate sea rations that were from 1943 <laughs> until they had uh, the kitchen set up for us <laughs> to have our mess hall set up. <clears throat> that was quite a different experience after being up in Chulai, I'll tell you. This is what this was our um, shower that has a bladder with the water on the top and nobody, you always wore your shoes, uh, tennis shoes in there because there were snakes that could come up underneath. There were many poisonous critters in, in this area of Vietnam. So it was um, definitely like camping. This is another uh, view of the hospital. Uh, that were the headquarters there uh, where they would get all of the um, paperwork side of what a hospital does. And then that was also intense, you can see. And then the Quonset huts were actually um, the like emergency room wards, labs, uh, and that's how that worked. The house, this, um, the three surgical rooms that we had, the operating rooms, were actually containers. And if you think of a, a semi truck and you cut the trailer in half, that's what that's about the size of each operating room that we had. And those were totally portable. You put them in on a crane, dropped them in place, and linked them up uh, so that you could put the uh, fuel through and the electricity. And the um, everything inside that part of the trailer, what I call it, but it was the OR, everything was bolted down. Everything was bolted in place. And it was small, but it was very efficient. It worked very well. This is what it looked like inside with the um, patients. And again, those, you see the inner tube-like structures of the ceiling or the sidewalls. Each one of those is inflatable. And the point of it was that if we got rocketed and we had frags going on the side of the, um, over the, so that the whole unit wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, fall apart. It would stay up. That was the theory of that. Um, it didn't always work. There you go. You see our revetments on the sides there. Those were six feet high because we were getting rocketed a fair amount. Um, so it didn't always work that they stayed up. And that's very scary to be inside one of those when that happened. I put this up here because, because I was an OR nurse and an emergency room nurse, I saw trauma. I saw wounds. Uh, we treated the casualties from that side of the war. But if you look at um, battlefield injuries, 69% of the admissions were really disease related. They were medical injuries, malaria, viral hepatitis, diarrhea, skin diseases. We did have venereal diseases there, uh, worms and fevers. Fever of unknown origin was really a tough one. Um, so we really had many more medical injuries than we did um, surgical injuries when you look at all of the injuries during the war. What happened because of the changes in medical treatment during the Vietnam War, it was because of the Vietnam War that the defibrillator was designed. You know, now you see that as an everyday thing. In, in our time in Vietnam, the defibrillator was only coming in when I finally left. If somebody's heart were to stop in those days, in the old days, I feel like it's Civil War medicine now, we would have a large needle and with adrenaline and we would shoot adrenaline into their heart or we would open up the chest and massage their heart to keep them going and keep them alive. And it was because the these average age of a soldier there was 19, had a better chance of surviving than somebody um, now, but the defibrillator was a great boon. The other thing that we worked on in surgery 
I don't know whether any of you know, I mean, I think some of you probably already had it yourself. It's called uh, TPN, where if you're very sick, you have IVs and it's not just salt and water, saline or sugar and water. Now we can give you proteins and fats in those. We were adding proteins to the bottles, to the IV bottles, and we're working on that to give um, the injured extra protein so that they weren't um, losing all of that in some of these massive injuries that they had in the burns. We did work on people that had napalm uh, burns. That was a tough one. And they would lose a lot of serum quickly. So we were starting to work on that. This is what this is a, another picture. And if you look, I'm starting to change over into black and white photos here. And I did that because I got tired of seeing blood. And it was a tough time for me psychologically, but towards the end, there was good parts of the war, but there's a lot of bad parts. And, uh, and so I started taking black and white photographs. That's why some of these, it's, it's not that I'm so old, <laughs> but it was like, that's what happened. I just didn't want to see the red anymore. And this is taking in uh, patients. That's how we carried them into the emergency room. They called it A&E. And I talk about the teamwork of the time that was there. Um, I'll never forget that time. We, we learned how to work well together, very close. And um, it's a time that you will never ever forget being able to work that closely with the people that you did and the lives that we touched. We will never ever forget that. That's a picture of me in the operating room. That's me after a bad, a bad case, a bad day. And there were many of those. This is um, some of my friends that were up in Chulai when we, we got to go on what's called R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. We went to Japan and uh, these are three other nurses because there were so few of us in like, hey, the only one of us could take leave at a time, but I'm on the far right. And then that's our driver. We're down in Saigon getting ready to go. And then this is my first husband. This is, uh, I met him in Lyke, and this is the day I was leaving. He stayed, he was a helicopter pilot. Um, but this is my last day in country, ready to go home. And then I came back to Travis. I think that's where a lot of people from the West Coast came back after they were overseas in Vietnam. Came back to San Francisco and that's it. This is a group of us. I put that at the end because we had a, a, a hospital reunion a few years ago in North Carolina because the 312th of AC was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That's where they were from. So we had a reunion there and this is all of us today, just a few years ago. It's pretty amazing. This is a picture on the wall. There's some names there of people that I know. I think all of us have people that we lost. And that's the, the wall that's in Washington DC on the um, off of Constitution. The memorial is uh, very special to all of us. And it's to, you can go there, you can get a rubbing of that, you can touch that wall. And I think that was um, the importance of our remembering, remembering. It's for all of those that didn't come home. They will never be forgotten. I'm gonna stop it right here. Um, this is, we had some other areas that happen after we come home, after we come home from the war. It's um, all these things that we're talking about on a um, legislative level now. I would just say that if you, if anybody who's listening to this, who's a Vietnam veteran who served, you maybe not didn't serve in country, but you served on a base that had Agent Orange or other toxic chemical herbicides that were there on that base. And there's um, compensation that is available for veterans that served in certain um, bases beside, and actually in um, Thailand now. And the Navy now has, um, compensation for, they call it Blue Water Navy as well as Brown Water Navy. That was the people that were on the coast versus people that served uh, 
on the rivers on those boats that if they were um, exposed to any of these herbicides that they have um, a capability of getting compensation for diseases and that's a whole list i'm not going to read them all but uh if you were a veteran that served on a base or in country or in Thailand or some of these other countries and had that, you should go to a veteran service representative and, um, and talk to them about compensation because uh, these are some more of these things that you're available to get. And I'm not gonna talk about the Gulf War. This is something that, the, um, that as our committee, the Women Veterans Committee of uh, uh, VVA, we made a coin a few years ago. We have a few of them left, but it's a challenge coin that we did for our 40, after our 40th anniversary for Vietnam Vets of America. And it's just something that we put together. There were eight women on the wall, eight women uh, that died. Uh, and so those daisies represent them. Um, at the bottom of that helmet. And it's just a coin for recognition for women that served uh, in Vietnam. Okay. I think we'll stop there. So thank you so much. This was really informative. And we hope that everyone will join us this Sunday at 11 o'clock for a live Q&A. So thank you very much.